The first ever USA Cycling Gravel National Championships will be held September 9th in Garing, Nebraska with $60,000 in prize money for the elite women and elite men. This race is big news for two reasons. One, it's the first ever gravel nationals. And two, it's also the first time USA Cycling, the governing body for bike racing in the U.S., is taking the lead on promoting and events. In this video, I speak with three people. I speak with USA Cycling CEO Brendan Quirk about the hows and the whys of USA Cycling putting this on. I speak to Aaron Rains, who's the promoter of the Rubidoux Rendezvous, a gravel race that's been held in Garing, Nebraska in years past, one that I've done. It's a good race. And uh, Aaron is also a key member of putting together the first gravel nationals since it's in his backyard largely on a course that he has run before. And then third, I speak to my friend Marcel Van Garderen, who will be the lead moto ref uh, of a handful of moto refs at this year's Gravel Nationals. Uh, I apologize in the video with Brendan, the hotel Wi-Fi was not cooperating, so the video dropped out partway through. So I'm just going to be putting in race footage uh, from the Rubidoux rendezvous uh, over that while we're talking. So you can get a look at what this course looks like, what the area looks like as we're hearing from Brendan about uh, what the race will likely be like. Take a second to subscribe. Now sit back and enjoy the ride into the first ever Gravel USA National Championships. Aaron Rains, race director of Rubidoux Rendezvous, and now the upcoming inaugural USA Cycling Gravel National Championships. How are you, sir? Good to see you. I'm good. I'm excited. Good to see you again, too. Yeah, so I, I did and very much enjoyed the Rubidoux Rendezvous last uh, year in Garing, Nebraska, which is where the first ever USA Cycling Gravel Nationals will be held, and I'm eager to see what gravel nationals will be like. Um, so I'm hoping you can, you can tell us what the future holds, uh, <laughs> as far as like what this will look and feel and, and smell and taste like, um, but maybe we can rewind a little bit and you could tell me like how this came to be at, at, yeah. at all. Like, you know, what, what was your involvement in getting nationals in Garing? Well, I, I don't have, uh, I think the amount of superpowers to tell you, you know, <laughs> what the future holds. Come on, um, man. I, yeah, <laughs> but I can I can tell you we're gonna have a good time. Um, you know, you mentioned Rubidoux. Um, this is this is wholly separate from that, right? Um, yes, I'm the race director for Rubidoux. the The USA Cycling National Championships. It's not my event. It's a USAC event. Um, and so, you know, rules and all that kind of stuff. That's all gonna be handled by them. They're totally in charge of race ops. Um, you know, the, the more local stuff, that's where I come in, um, you know, having a good time, you know, inviting the breweries, you know, having the food trucks, making sure the expo is dialed, uh, having, make sure everybody has all the facilities they need, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm working with the tourism board and local city officials to make sure that happens. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can say, though, that in my conversations with USA Cycling, like, I think all of us who have been in, in gravel for a while, maybe we're a little apprehensive, um, you know, and so when this opportunity came through to us via the Nebraska Sports Commission, um, you know, I took a couple days to think about it. And then I started having conversations with Tara at USAC and that kind of thing. And I, I really, I started to realize, you know, they want to do this the right way. This is going to be a gravel event. Um, as much of the spirit of gravel as there can be, uh, you know, equal prize payout, equal distance racing, that kind of thing. I think we've all seen, um, that doing that a different way is not the way to go. Um, so it's, it's going to be a good time. Uh, we're still in the beginning stages of, of planning, obviously, but we're going to, we're going to have a fun time. That's what it's all about. So tell us about courses. You saw the, the elite women, elite men course will be 130 miles and then there will be different or shorter courses for age groupers 
yeah exactly. how similar or dissimilar and you know like the long long event at Robo rendezvous is a 100 miles so mm-hmm. will this be for those folks who have done Robo will this be like that plus plus some or will be totally different or halfway in between yeah um I would say we're we're adding to it um you know you've been on the Robo course we like to kind of visit different zones uh, around the area. And that's just what this is. Um, we've always, there's a particular zone southeast of town um, that we've always wanted to explore. And this has kind of provided the perfect opportunity to go do that. And so you'll see a lot of the highlights from the Rubidoux course uh, with with additions. Yeah. I, I know you just said you can't predict the future, but one feature of Rubidoux in addition to the beautiful you know, Western landscapes is the, the wind is a factor. Like that's one of the few gravel races where I have mounted and very much appreciated having aero bars. Yep. So will it, will it be, will it be windy in September in Garing? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, make the request that it is not. <laughs> uh, typically, um, we did have one year we had to do the, I think it was in 2020, you know, mid pandemic, we, we postponed our race and, uh, did a race in September and it, it was pretty windy. Uh, that's, not, I wouldn't say that's typical though. Um, but when the wind comes, it, it comes for sure. Now, what are your thoughts as the man who wears the race director hat for Robidoux and now will wear the local liaison hat for nationals about rules, you know, like in the gravel community, we like to clown the idea of the spirit of gravel, like, uh, the good man, Dave at gravel stoke has made up an, an icon of the gravel is a ghost, which I very much appreciate. Yeah. You know, the idea being that in gravel, there are no rules, but you still shouldn't be a jerk face and you should just abide by the spirits being, we're not putting these down in text, but you know, don't punch people in the face. Don't steal their water, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, what are your thoughts on the necessity for rules? I think when you have new riders, and thousands of them entering a sport where they feel comfortable and safe because they're not on pavement. Um, You know, that kind of thing, I think establishing rules and written guidelines when you're talking about open roads, crossing train tracks, um, any of this kind of stuff, anything we can do to level up the, the amount of safety that we bring into gravel racing for everyone is positive. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if it, if it's just back in the old days, you sent in your postcard and there were 80 people out on a hundred mile course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can get away with, uh, you know, a little bit looser of restrictions. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing a thousand, 2000, 3000 people on the same course any given day. You know, I think people having guidelines and yeah, rules to call them what they are. I think that's, that's a positive step. Now, how about how about money? So, the, you know, Robodo this year has got what a twenty three thousand dollar purse. Yep, which is enormous for a one day gravel event. Um, yeah, and then now Nationals has a sixty thousand dollar purse. How do you think that affects racing in terms of who shows up or doesn't? Um, you know, we we already know some hitters are planning on doing Nationals, right? I think Keegan. Uh, and Lauren were both mentioned in the press release. They both had, had quotes. Um, I think that'll go a long way. We've seen it with Lifetime. We've seen it with Steamboat. We've seen it, you know, uh, a number of, of ways. Yeah, there's still a very successful events that don't have prize purses and in the spirit of gravel or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but there's a lot of success that we've already seen. And, you know, throwing 60 grand into the mix, like, it can only amplify, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah, I'll be eager to see who shows up and what the what the whole first USA Cycling Gravel Nationals is all about. One more question, then I'll let you be on your way, sir. Where should people eat when in Garing, Nebraska? Ooh, we'll have a ton of food trucks. Uh, our food food truck scene is blowing up, so we'll have a ton of those. Um, there's great places all along you know, Main Street, there's the mixing bowl uh, for great breakfast and lunch options. You've got the brewery uh, over in Scott's Bluff, all that kind of stuff. So there's plenty of spots and we'll have, you know, whole 
uh, tech guide with with all that kind of stuff mentioned. Yeah, see, I mean, if Roboto's in any indication, yeah, it'll be a good, good scene, good party before and after. So look forward to seeing you up yeah, there. That's yeah, thanks for your time, Aaron. Appreciate you and good luck on this. Yeah, no problem. I think I'll need a little bit of it. <laughs> Marcel Van Garderen, my friends, good to see you. Good to see you, Ben. Now, you are a, a, a man of many talents. Uh, I know you as my old Dutch teammate from road racing back in the day. I also know you as as a USA Cycling Moto uh, referee. I think that's what yeah. I've seen you at, at more bicycle events in the last few years. And then uh, also happen to be father to a, a fellow by the name of TJ Van Garderen, a longtime oh. world tour racer. <laughs> so just for, just for context for for viewers yeah. as to who is this guy in the hat today or in that hat um i'm curious to hear about your involvement with gravel nationals like how you b- f- became involved and just sort of like what your what your take on it is it's you know gravel racing is such a funny contentious topic like some people are big fans and some people are big fans of talking smack about gravel racing, especially when it yeah. gets serious. So that's why this, you know, gravel nationals coming on the heels of gravel worlds is of interest. So like, yeah, what's, you know, how did you get involved with this? Um, so I started uh, working some gravel races a number of years ago. Um, did a couple of them in Colorado, the steamboat gravel race, um, as well as the crusher and the tusher in Utah. Um, did the uh, rad in uh, southern colorado and all those were um, events where i had a photographer on the back of my motorcycle so i got contacts through um you know working bike races and then photographers are knowing that i'm not working a race because there's no officials typically at gravel races right right and so we um we got in touch and they're like hey can you um can you drive me for this race um, where i'm planning to take photos i'm, I'm signed to do uh, photo work and I'm like, yeah, sure. And so that's how I got involved with working some of those gravel races. And, um, yeah, you, you show up at some of those gravel races. And then, um, I got a, an email from USA cycling, uh, yesterday morning, um, asking like, um, Hey, we're going to do nationals. That was the first time I heard about that. Hmm. Uh, we're doing nationals and we're looking at, um, having some motor officials there. And my first reaction was like, what rules are we enforcing? <laughs> but there have been, and I think right. that's a big part of the appeal, right? It was originally with mountain biking, there were no real rules um, established. And so now with gravel racing, it's kind of like the, um, what do you call that? Um, kind of the, um, the, the rebellious way to ride a bike, right? No rules. And you just ride where you, where you like with your friends and have fun. And, um, and that seems to be kind of like the, the, um, what, what gravel racing is all about. So now, with nationals, um, they want to um, kind of have a little bit more of a, a tighter container around um, different groups being able to ride together. So the, the intent of the motos at gravel nationals is to um, really um, prevent, for instance, if the elite women catch the elite men, um, to prevent them from working together. And that has happened in, at other gravel races. I don't remember if you remember Steamboat. Yeah I, wrote, where, yeah, I wrote um, the story for Villanus working with the women, which I don't see any issue with it. If you don't, if that's not a rule that they can't work together, then that's fine. Um, but I think for nationals, they want to keep it a little bit cleaner and let the, the men race together for their national championship and the women together for their national championship and not have the groups going together. And so we're going to have um, elite men, elite women, and then a bunch of the masters. And I don't know if there's going to be any juniors, but a bunch of other categories that are going to start after them and they, we're going to have to prevent them from uh, like, if they catch each other to, um, to kind of have clean passes and not work together. We don't, we don't want riders that are in a group that have gotten dropped to help another group of riders back up to um, a, their lead group or something like that. And it happens quite a bit. I mean, we've, we've done other races where we've kind of had to work through that challenge of, of different groups working with other groups that are not supposed to be working together. Yes, of course. Yeah. And that's, that certainly makes sense in USAC road racing. You know, I wrote yeah. that story, the spirit of gravel, uh, f- at the steamboat yeah. uh, edition where, yeah, I saw you there. And yeah, yeah. yeah, my, my issue 
with it was that if, if we're not going to have rules, fine, let's not shake our fingers and try to enforce spirit. Exactly. Like either we yeah. have rules or we don't have rules and in yeah. either way is fine. But, yeah. but like, then we will all play by those. Yeah, yeah. Like there shouldn't be a spirit, you know, it's like any other sport in basketball, yeah. there's like, or soccer, there's an out of bounds line. Yeah. And it, that's where it is. And it's either inbounds or it's out of bounds. And of course the referee, like yourself, sometimes you know, they make a mistake, but, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's like, we're, we're agreed on where the line is. There's yeah. no, just, well, we'll just, we'll just have a spirit of an out of bounds line. Cause like, that's yeah, yeah. Not, <laughs> that doesn't really work. That, that's not a thing. No. Uh, tell me about driving in gravel, in and around gravel races versus at road races, you know? So like when you're on a moto at, you know, tour of California or, or tour of Colorado, USA pro challenge, whatever yeah. it was called. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, dust, I mean, dust is a factor easier. for writers. So how, how yeah. can yeah, you, sure. um, uh, so as, as officials, um, and you're officiating a group of cyclists, the easiest position is to be behind them because everything happens in front of you. You can see what, what's going on. So there is that factor of, you know, you're not kicking dust up in, in the rider's faces at some point, if something happens, you're going to have to get to the front and like during a road race, you would, I'd have to tell somebody, Hey, you, you need to watch the yellow, the center line rule violation. So, but th that's during a road race, right? So there's not really that dust kicking up thing. I don't really think that the kicking up of the dust is going to be an issue until two groups are going to catch each other. Because then if let's say I'm in a, in a group, that's a slower group and I have another official that's behind me, his group is coming up on mine. We have radio communication in our helmets and we're going to say, okay, I'm going to slow my group down a little bit because they're already going slower. There's no break up the road. We're going to pull them over to the side road, not stopping, but having them go a little bit slower, all right in front of them typically. And then the, um, the faster group can go by them. As soon as, they have a, if, as soon as there's a clear gap, I will pull in behind my group again and let them kind of um, take up racing again. And so mm -hmm. that, that transition um, a lot of times works really, really well, especially if the riders are – um cooperative but i've also had it where it just didn't work well and i had to pull my group over to the side of the road and i just stood there for two minutes waiting with them until i let them go again because they were just not um cooperating and so that there's a couple of different ways that we can do that i don't really think that the that the kicking up of the dust is going to be a big issue that that happens mainly and i've happened with me i as I was having a photographer or a videographer on the back of my motorcycle that they want the front of the race, right? They want the, the couple of guys that are just setting the pace or that are yes. trying to break away. They want them on, on a, a video or on the photo. And so that becomes the issue. So I always try to stay off to the, to the, to the side farther. Um, so that, that is kind of like how, um, how we're dealing with that. How about, uh, speaking of closed roads and open roads, you know, gravel races are always on open roads. That's part of the charm and yeah. of how, how it's feasible for promoters to put on these long distance events because they're not paying cops to shut down roads. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, as you know, part of the danger. One thing I've appreciated about doing USA Cycling's road nationals is that there's a bubble and it's, you know, whether that was like, you know, I've done them in Tennessee, just did one uh, this past year down in New Mexico and yeah. having police enclosure uh, as an amateur writer uh, is one, it's a treat. And two, it just feels a lot <laughs> safer uh, yeah. when you've got, yeah, I haven't, I haven't you know, seen that you know what the gravel the... races that I've worked where it's no. um, where, where they have like, so you're saying that, that you're, the race that you're talking about, they had a police escort ahead of the race where they kind of did a rolling closure like they would at a pro race. Like Correct. A pro road race. Correct. For okay. road nationals. Yeah. That that would be that would make a lot of sense. Um, you're also running into like now you're having a car in front of you or, or a motorcycle kicking up dust, you know. So if you can get those guys out, th this is this is the challenge in in uh, pro road races too, like Tour of California, Utah, and Colorado. Um, there's those are all run on open roads too, and we have a rolling closure. Yes. Um, and so you have to have somebody, you know, at least. 30 or 40 seconds ahead of the peloton in case there's a car coming. So they can say, Hey, there's a peloton coming. You have to kind of explain this yes. and then you have to get going again. And so most of the time that works really, really well. And people are like, they're kind of exciting because most of the time these, all these races are on, on small roads, even the, you know, tour of California are a lot of times on smaller roads and the people are like, Oh my God, what's happening. This is so exciting. And they come out with it, take their phones out and take pictures. And they're pretty exciting. 
And sometimes you end up with people that are like, I pay for my taxes and I'm going to use the road. And then you're like, <laughs> then you have a police next to you. And you're like, Hey, can you take care of this guy? Yeah. So, I mean, I think for nationals, it makes a lot of sense. I don't know if that's the plan um, at this point. So yeah, we'll, yeah. Uh, we'll find out uh, over the next few months as uh, some of the, um, those things get ironed out. How many moto officials do you expect to have? So they asked me to uh, get five for now. So I'm okay. not sure if that's going to be mainly for the, the front groups, the faster groups. Um, my suspicion is they're going to be more than, than five categories. So, um, but maybe the, the, the smaller categories, the lower categories are not going to get um, direct moto support. Uh, right. I'm, not official with them. I'm not 100% sure about that. What, one more question, sir, and then I'll let you get back to your day. I know you're eager to get out there and do some mountain biking once it warms it's up. It's a little cold over here yet. <laughs> <Don't get laughs> <warms> <laughs> now, are you in Fruta or Moab? Moab. Yeah, we just got yeah. to Moab. My friend. When, when you're on your moto in these events, are you missing racing yourself, or are you happy to be there on a big, powerful bike where you can hit the throttle? <laughs> it's funny because um, – I mean, I've, I started racing when I was 12 years old in Europe, um, gr- growing up in, in the Netherlands, where it's one of the most popular sports in, in the country. Um, and I've so I've raced since maybe like two years ago. In the last couple of years, I've done a few mountain bike races. I've never actually raced a gravel race, which hopefully I'm changing this year. I'm going to uh, try to do a couple of gravel races in Colorado. Um, it's, I, I, I have really lost um, motivation to train hard and compete in my category like there's there's some guys that are you know former giro uh racers and so they're they're super fast and i just have not don't have the motivation anymore to train hard enough to be able to compete with them and yes. so it, i've done i still ride a lot i like my mountain bike all the time i ride my gravel bike all the time i've gotten less and less excited about riding my road bike not only because i don't feel the motivation to compete against the guys that are still putting in, you know, 15 hours a week. Um, I also felt a real um, kind of concern with riding my road bike on the road. Um, you know, there's over the past few years, there have been several of my friends, like one of them lost his wife. Um, another guy was in the in the hospital for, uh, for, for many weeks, uh, getting everything, all his bones put back together. And it just, I don't know, I just don't really want to take that risk anymore. And it seems like from... As I ride my motorcycle on open roads, when I go travel uh, to bike races or travel for myself, um, I see more and more people because I have a lot higher view and I'm passing cars. I see people on their phone all the time, and mm-hmm. a distracting, distracted driver is um, is just a real concern when you're riding on the road. And so mm-hmm. that's why I just, you know, that in combination with just trying to come up with, you know, trying to. I mean, when you compete, when you want to compete, even in the in the fifty plus category, I mean, you know that. Yeah, it takes a lot of your your time and effort. You have to kind of live for that. You know, like every day you're gonna have to go do this. And there's just as I get older, there's just so many other things that I want to do. You know, I hear um, you. So I kind of have let that go. I still I still enjoy like towing the line and, and doing a mountain bike race here and there. And um, I'm really hoping to um, to do some gravel races here, and I think it'll be fun. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. One of the things I love about gravel racing is that it doesn't even have to be a race, you know, yeah. like at the yeah. front, there's pretty often at the big races, there's plenty of fast kids who will give you all the competition you can handle. But then there's yeah. a lot of people who are there just to, you know, sort of the way people will do the boulder, boulder here, the 10 K yeah. with your yeah. family. Like you just go for part of it and you stop and you eat, you eat Doritos, you do the slip and slide, like you just hang, <laughs> you know, you hang out yeah, right. and yeah, you've got yeah. a number on, but like, are you, are you, thinking that you're going to beat the world's elite runners at the front. Like, no, you're just have, like, yeah. having a, having a good social time. So, yeah. well, I certainly appreciate you keeping us safe out there on the roads at bike races. I've enjoyed that at the uh, road events. Yeah, totally good I, seeing I you. look forward to seeing you in Nebraska here this fall for the yeah. first ever USA gravel nationals. I'm excited to do the first one. That'll be, that'll be a, a good milestone for, uh, for USA cycling for sure. Yeah. Cool. Right on Marcel. Thank What's you for your up, time, man? sir. Have That's fun good. mountain biking. Yeah, sounds good. We'll do that. Have a good one. Brendan Quirk, CEO of USA Cycling. It's good to see you, sir. How are you? Doing great, Ben. Good to see you again. Hope you're well. Things good? Yeah, 
Yeah, things things are good. So gravel nationals. This is this is big news for a couple reasons. You know, one, it's obviously the you know the inaugural event, um, and the first time things are always big news. But also, you know, the the merging of USA Cycling as a bike racing organization back with gravel racing, which have been sort of two two separate things. So I just you know appreciate you taking the time. I want to pick your brain about you know the the driving motivations uh, for USA Cycling and, and sort of what you you know, expect to see in this first year event. So yeah, it just started to start like, why just to ask a a kind of a dumb, obvious question, why a gravel nationals? (laughs) And uh, did that, when did that process start? Yeah, I think, you know, we've, you, you take the, you know, the, the, the long answer is I would say that the prospect of considering gravel racing for our organization goes back almost two years ago when we uh, gave some serious thought to being the uh, the LOC and hosting the inaugural Gravel World Championships. And we had extensive conversations with the UCI. That was by my predecessor, Rob Demartini. Um, but they got pretty far down the road on that and um, couldn't quite get it across the line. But I think that from an organizational standpoint, we're really starting to focus on how could we be involved in gravel racing organizationally and started with that. And then I would say in terms of more of like the cultural side of gravel, I just, you know, I think anybody who's observing the gravel scene sees that there's this you know, bifurcation going on in gravel right now. Over here, you've got more of the spirit of gravel events, you know, mass participation. It's, it's what most of the people are there to do. It's to really challenge themselves. But, you know, it's just it's to have fun. Um, on the other hand, what you're also seeing is the reality of genuine, you know, knives out gravel racing happening. You look at the pointy end of pretty much any event out there now of any kind of renown. And, and, you know, the racing is legit. It's serious. You look at the caliber of racers, you know, in the U S it's, I think we all know who the you know people are who are doing well, you know, Lauren and Keegan and the rest, but you look at gravel worlds, for example, the kind of people who showed up to that in the first year, you know, these are guys who are top 10 in the tour of Flanders currently racing on the world tour road uh, or the world tour pro scene on the road. You kind of see on a global basis, there, uh, there's a real appetite for the best racers out there to show up for gravel worlds, probably for their national championships. You know, there's an E, I believe there's an EU championship now. You're going to see the best riders come out for that. So this is just, you know, this is the trend of the sport. It's really, I think it's two complementary sort of, um, you know, aspects of it against spirit of gravel and genuine racing. Um, and it's just time for just as time for gravel worlds. It's time for gravel nationals. And we're really excited about it. Mm-hmm. Me too. I mean, you know, you touched, you mentioned spirit of gravel a few times. I, I wrote an article a couple of years ago with, you know, Lauren de Crescenzo, de Crescenzo winning steamboat gravel with the help from some teammates. And yeah, the story there was, well, yeah, well, that's not against the rules because Amy Charity didn't have rules about cooperating with teammates at a gravel event, but it was against the spirit. And then, yeah, that yeah. created this whole uproar, which is like now a meme and it's a thing. And, um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, my take at the time, and it still is, if, as you mentioned, if it's going to be serious racing, when you're playing a game or a sport, it behooves everyone to agree upon the rules of the game. You know, yep. it's like, are, are the out-of-bounds rules here or here? Like, when you score a basket, is it two points or three points? Like, Yeah, exactly. Let's, let's, let's just agree on what the rules are. The, the rules can be, there are no rules, but let's just agree on what those are and go forward. So, you know, one question I'm curious about for gravel nationals is what what exactly are the rules you know you've got uh, uh, separate fields you know the pro women have a field the pro men have a field that will start separately and then age groupers will will start separately uh your website has some information about you know distance and the the elite race will be 131 miles um 130 yeah about 130 miles about six thousand feet of climbing yeah exactly Uh, what what other rules are already in place, and what do you do you expect to have uh, lined out? You know, as far as yep. like n- neutral aid stations, for instance, I saw it's like you know, every twenty miles there's aid, but like, can you take hand ups? Can can teams yep. be handing bottles? Like, yeah. it's a great question. I think so. A couple a couple of rules that we we knew would be important at the outset, like you said, men and women are going to start separately. Age groups will be in intervals. Um, to the best of our ability, we're going to try to, to monitor things so that um, um, different groups don't really race with each other. It's going to be tough to monitor that in the age group classes. We recognize that. 
Um, you know, we're going to learn a lot in this first year. We're going to definitely be looking at it really carefully in the elite races. Um, but men and women being separate, we feel like that's important. Really lifetime with the changes they made to Unbound. I think they really set the, the tone for that. Um, and so it's a pretty easy decision for us. Most of the elite racers we talked to actually said they thought that was a good thing. And so it was pretty, pretty easy decision for us. Another easy decision is no arrow bars. It just, I just, um, I just, for a lot, all the reasons we know, you know, arrow bars and mass start races, just not a great idea. I mean, when was the last time you're excited to ride somebody next to somebody in a pace line who had arrow bars on? Um, not great. So <laughs> yeah. that was another uh, easy decision. Um, you know, aid stations, yeah, we'll have neutral every 20. And then there will be one private aid station. Um, you, you don't have to stop. You don't have to unclip. You can do hand ups there. Um, so that's another one that people were concerned about. Um, you know, it's, I think there was a lot of kind of hype around rules, rules, rules. But then when you really dig into, well, what are the sensitive rules or what are the touchy rules? They're not a whole lot. And so those are the ones that we know of now. We're continuing to be an active conversation with riders. And, um, you know, we've got, what, five, six months until the race. So, you know, as issues are brought up that we need to kind of get ahead of, we will do that. But for now, the key, really the key ones were, what, what are, how's, how's feeding being done? What's the start look like? And what's the, the treatment of arrow bars? And, and, you know, we've got all that laid out. Mm -hmm. And and the groups working together are not working together. And yeah, we, yeah, we that, want to avoid yeah, that. That's, that's and, a major you know, one. I think, yeah. To other, you know, I think it's how much of it's self-policing and how much can you police on a gravel course? I don't know, but you know, number plates, will they be different colors for different age, you know, different categories? Yeah. I mean, that's an easy way. So you can look at the person next to you and say, Hey, what's going on? Um, you know, it's self-policing, you know, probably we'll have to have some of that, but um, you know, we're, we're going to do our best to be on top of it. One other thing that's be a little bit unique here is that um, riders won't choose their own distance. Their distance will be dictated by their age category. So elites, and many of the age group categories will race the 130 mile race. We're still working on now trying to think what that cutoff is for masters racers. Is it 50 plus, 60 plus, 70 plus that um, it's 10 year age increments, right? Our age brackets are going to marry up to the UCIs. Um, and so rather than doing the typical five year age categories that, you know, if you ever did masters road, you might be familiar with. Um, they're going to be, I believe they're 10 year age categories, you know, 30 yes. to 39, 40 to 49. Which one of those? um does 130 and which one's going to do our shorter course of 70 we're still we're still talking to the community to figure that out it's the same on the junior side 17 18 almost certainly will do the 130 but below that age group you know will everybody else do 70 we haven't quite nailed that down yet but we're going to get that sorted pretty soon the sixty thousand dollar prize purse that to my knowledge is the biggest uh package prize package for one day gravel race not just in the U.S., but uh, internationally. Yeah, and also to my knowledge, like that, you've never had a prize purse for you know road, road or cross yep. or mountain bike nationals. So, two questions: Yeah, one, why, why a big purse for gravel nationals, and uh, two, where is that funding coming from? Yeah, let me answer the second question first because that one's really easy. Um, I, I think the thing I want to stress is that you know, look, take a step back. USA Cycling, we're a nonprofit. Um, we're a nonprofit that, uh, you know, nonprofits are there to serve a mission and, um, our mission is twofold. On the one hand, we exist to grow the sport of grassroots bike racing all across America. On the other hand, our goal is to, uh, work towards sustained international success by our national team. And so, um, you know, I just want to, and so what that means is that when you look on the grassroots side, our membership model funds grassroots programming to help local associations, clubs, event organizers, et cetera, grow the sport on a local level. That's really what we do when we're operating at the highest level. None of the resources that we have budgeted towards those programs are being diverted for Gravel Nationals. So um, you know, no membership revenue is being used to, um, to fund this prize first, just to be really clear. It's being funded by entry fees and being funded by um, sponsorship revenue. And um, that's, you know, so it's just gonna be really clear. It's a separate bucket of money. In terms of why are we doing it? We're doing it because it's just a couple of reasons. Number one, that's a thing in gravel now, right? A SBT has a prize purse, uh, be, you know, Belgian Waffle Ride, got a prize purse. Lifetime doesn't, to my knowledge, have an individual event prize purse, but it's got a heck of a, um, you know, a series prize purse. This is yes. a thing now. Um, 
the reason all these events do it is the same reason why we're doing it. You have a prize purse. Um, it's a, it's, you know, it gets the turnout that you want from the elite riders. It creates energy. It creates excitement. It's really, it's a, it's a marketing investment as much as anything else that drives mass participation turnout that drives the entry fees. It also drives sponsor interest. Um, and that, um, you know, as, as that flywheel goes, um, you know, the following year, you get more people to enter. The following year, you get more people to enter. You get more sponsorship interest. The economics really start to work in the event. Um, it clearly works for, um, you know, the, the great events, the great gravel events in America right now. Clearly works for SBT, BWR, clearly works for our friends at Lifetime. Um, you know, just because we're a nonprofit doesn't mean we can't pursue this, a similar sort of economic model. And so that's what we're going to try. And it might be a total failure. This, I will tell you. Let's be really clear. This is my decision. If people want to jump up and down and say, you know, who's the idiot who came up with this? I'm the idiot who came up with this. <laughs> but to me, this is best practice in the private sector um, and nonprofits need to find economic sustainability. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, and, and, you know, you look at you look at right now this dynamic of elite racing and mass participation events. Everybody's like, oh, that's that's something that only happens in gravel. Well, gravel has done that in a really visible way, but let's be clear. We have almost 2,000 participants at our mountain bike national championships. We have about 1,200 participants at our cyclocross national championships. Um, I think very quickly gravel nationals will be our largest event in terms of participation. And if what we determine is that this prize purse is instrumental, again, towards driving that flywheel that grows participation, allows us to invest in the race experience and grow and grow and grow, we will absolutely apply that to mountain bike nationals. We will absolutely apply that to cyclocross nationals if we believe that the same strategy is going to work for those two disciplines. But we've got to test it somewhere. Um, it clearly this works, uh, at least for others, it works. And so the place we're going to test it for the first time is gravel nationals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, the chance to get a big check, you know, it's like 12,000 to the winner and yep. first ever, you know, stars and stripes Jersey. Yeah. That should Lure in the big names. Well, the and it's and not the, just the that. And... Yeah. And so it's automatic. So t the podium, the top three in the elite race will all qualify for the gravel world championships in, in Tuscany. And then all of the age group winners will also automatically qualify for uh, the world championship as well. So, you know, if, if you are ambitious as a gravel athlete, I mean, granted, a lot of Americans kind of look skeptically at the course that they saw last year in Italy for gravel worlds. But gravel worlds is gravel worlds. Yeah, well, of course. But this is not, I don't think that what this was not was the UCI saying, this is how we want to design a gravel course. This is just you know, the, the Italian organizers. This is what they decided that they want to do. And you know what? That's the right of an LOC to do what they want to do. 2023 is the last year that this group is going to host it. And then in 2024, it moves on. I forget to where it goes. But um, I think you'll see a very different course in, in 24 once it leaves Italy and one that will very probably incorporate less pavement, more gravel, more technical stuff. But 2023, you know, we just got to take what we've got and, um, and roll with it. But gravel worlds are a thing. It's a, the, the, the UCI gravel worlds is a thing. And, um, they're both things, uh, both that, gravel worlds are yeah, things. They're both, things. They're yeah. both definitely things. Yeah. And I love them both, <laughs> but, um, the gravel, you know, look, gravel worlds, um, you know, global gravel world by the UCI. I mean, that's, that is going to be a phenomenon pretty much from here to eternity. Um, and, uh, it is where there's so much energy and excitement, uh, here in America. And so we're, we're fired up to be part of it. We want to see an American win a, a rainbow Jersey. I mean, that's, that is, that would be amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. imagine if Keegan or, you know, Finsty or one of these guys goes and, and wins worlds. They go over there and beat guys who are top 10 in the Tour of Flanders, you know, top 10 in the Cyclocross World Cup. That would be amazing. And that would mm. do, I mean, it'd be a big step forward for the growth of the sport in America. It would be a hell of a story. So we want to be supportive of that. Two more questions, please, sir, then I'll let you get back to your day. Uh, one a short one, one a longer one. One, what do you expect to see numbers wise in this first year as far as participation? And I will say I've got a dog in this fight. I've got a, a bet for a Belgian beer. A friend said they won't have more than 500 and I've said they'll easily top 500. What, what are your, uh, yeah. So I don't know. I'm, out, I'm, I'm happy to be trend. Like one thing we're trying to do at USA cycling transparency is what I'm preaching transparency and communication. So I'm happy to share. I will be sharing with you very transparently how we built our budget and in terms of participation and the way our current budget is built 
it's our assumption is 500, let's call it adult or 500, you know, it's 300 juniors and 500 of everybody else. So it's 800 participants is how we've built it out. I, I can tell you, um, I've, I've put on other races. I've been in retail where you have to build out a merchandising strategy. When you budget in a granular basis like that, 100% of the time you get it wrong. But when you build a budget, <laughs> you, have to throw, you have to throw something in Excel. And so that's sure. what we did. I would say we have fairly you know, um, restrained ambitions um, for the race, but it's a conservative budget. And, um, but we budgeted 800 riders all together. We'll see what we get. Sure. Last question, a little more nuanced is the, the culture piece. You know, USA Cycling has been involved in bike racing since, you know, it was called USDCF. And, you know, most road races, mountain bike races, cross races still in the United States, you know, uh, operate under the auspices of USAC. Gravel has been largely existing outside of USA Cycling in the few furious years that it's been a thing here. I know you personally have been to a number of events and are aware of how these events work, but how do you think USA Cycling will get the the culture piece? I realize that's a very kind of vague, fuzzy uh, term, yeah. but w will it? Do you expect gravel nationals to feel like other gravel races around the country, or will it feel like something different? You know, what, what are you expecting there? Um, you know, so so we have been involved. It's, it's kind of a little known fact. We have been involved in gravel in the background. Um, you know, a lot of these gravel events are uh, being put on by event organizers, many of whom are entrepreneurs new to the world of event promotion. And they were like, hey, I live in this great place for a gravel race. I want to put it on. How do I put on a bike race? And that is like a supporting event organizers who want to know how to put on a well-run, safe bike race. Like we, one of the absolute fundamental reasons why organization exists is to support event promoters in doing that. And so we do that on a regular basis. And the number of well-known events in the United States that are actually we support and we actually sanction those events. You know, um, rule of three is one. The Grasshopper in California, that whole series, that's another one. Um, these are races where we provide them direct support. And, you know, you're signing a USA Cycling release waiver, release or waiver and, and release um, on behalf of the event promoter when you go to, to those events. Now, we don't require a license. Um, but we are directly supporting those events. That is where we have gotten more and more deeply involved in the sport. It's not through our relationships with riders, through a license or a membership, but rather the path has been through event promoters and helping them actually get events off the ground and give them, giving them the resources they need to execute the event. And so I think the, the amount of goodwill and momentum that we have within Gravel because of that is significant. Now, in, in terms of will it feel like a gravel event? Well, it depends on what you mean. I think we've all seen the gravel events where there's a pop-up table and people are shooting tequila halfway through the race with some, you know, beautiful vista in the background. No, there's not going to be a tequila station, you know, at our event. Um, but yeah. um, we, but but we will have a significant turnout of age group riders who I feel like will look at this as a bucket list event. And they're going to go out there, and even if they're not racing for a Stars and Stripes jersey, I'll be there. I'm going to ride. I'm not competing for a Stars and Stripes jersey, but I want to go out there with my best riding friends and have a really memorable time. That's to me that is very consistent with a lot of what the gravel culture is about. Um, in terms of, of it's a, that's important to us, but what's also important is that knives out. You know, we've all been real bike racers before. You know, we're there together trying to kill each other on the bike. You know, making sure that that happens and that experience is amazing for those athletes. Um, you know, that's also really, really important to us. And so we're, we we recognize that we're trying to serve two basic demographics here. Um, again, more of the participation minded ones and then the racers as well. We want it to be an awesome experience for both. I think if we do that, um, you know, we will I think we'll get high marks. Um, will, will it be cool? I think it's really cool to race for a Stars and Strike jersey. So I think from a culture piece or a coolness piece, it's going to be pretty cool. Sweet. Well, Brendan Quirk, USA Cycling CEO, I certainly appreciate your time. And I think we're in different age groups, but I will absolutely see How you there. You in, I'm 46. I look like I'm oh, 104, youngster. but I'm, 
but I'm still, yeah. I don't know if it's baby, baby masters. I think baby masters is still like, you know, 30 plus, but yeah, but no, yeah, I cracked uh, the fifties. So it's, it's, uh, I'm sure it'll be just as hard, if not harder, but I'll, I'll yeah. I will, uh, wave to you as you ride off from me. Early on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for Thanks, your time. Man. Thank you for putting on the first ever Gravel National Championships. Excited. Thanks for having me on, Ben. Bye. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And whether you hold a USA Cycling license or you not, enjoy the ride. There you go, there you go.